people see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Can, can you hear me? There we go. I've got my phone with me today because I might look at the time because there's a lot in these chapters. Did you read your, your Bible? If you didn't get a calendar, right here's a calendar. You should have read Romans chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And next week you'll read 11 through 15, and there's where 12 is. And Romans 12 has got a lot in it. But Romans 8 especially for a Christian... If you don't understand life in the Spirit, if you're not in tune with the Spirit, you're like a car with no gasoline. You're not going anywhere. You might be like Lazarus, still wrapped up in his burial clothes. I'll explain more so you understand that. <clears throat> and last week, Sherry said that I said something that confused her a little bit. I want to clarify that. And if you ever have questions again, like I said, ask me. When you're justified, you are set right with God. And then you are brought into a new relationship with Him, not only set right, but as His child. Something that was never experienced in the Old Testament, wasn't experienced until Jesus came, that we could cry out by the Spirit indwelling in us, Abba, Father. Abba being the common day word for Daddy that I can cry out, Daddy, Father, because of that relationship I never knew before. And nothing can change that. Nothing can take that away. No unpardonable sin can come after the moment that you have been justified. But there is the question of whether you have been justified. Okay? We can get into so much theology and theory. We can say whether you can lose your salvation. Stuff. We're not going to go down that road. If you are justified, you are justified and set right with God. And you have an obligation to live right. But that does not mean you can go on sinning, and some of that is answered in, this, in these chapters. There is no sin that's going to separate you, but if you're justified, if the Holy Spirit lives in you, then the Holy Spirit is indwelling with your spirit so that you will live a life without sin. John said, if you sin. Now, will we sin? More than likely, yes. That's why Paul wrote in chapter 7, I continue to do the things that I choose not to do. And the moment that you think yourself in your own mind that you're pretty holy, there, right there you just sin, guys. <laughs> but we will also be held accountable. That was what Sherry said that I didn't mention. For not only everything we did in the body, but everything we said in the body, and even what we thought in our bodies. Just because we're a child, just because we've been justified and set right, doesn't mean we don't sin, won't sin and doesn't mean we don't have an obligation. 
Now saying that, let's dig into these chapters. Last Sunday, I took my kids to meet their dad in Sandpoint. And I almost didn't sin going down there. I like to use driving because it's a good thing we all sin at. The law says the speed limit is, but I always drive more than that, don't I? I break the law. Break it the law. Break it the law. I almost didn't break the law last Sunday because I got behind this guy driving so slow and I followed him. There was no chance to pass. And of course, there's a line behind us. And you can imagine the signs that people gave as they passed by and everything else. Because the guy was driving slow. Slow. Hmm. But when I hit the four-lane section, what did I do? I was just one right behind him. What did I do? I passed him. I didn't speed up to 80 or 90 mile an hour. I just passed him. I got passed like I was standing still, sitting still. I didn't go as fast as those guys did, but I'm still a sinner. I still did wrong as far as the moral law. We know what the speed limit is. We know what the fines are, the penalties are. But we choose to disobey them. Here's the funny thing, though. That guy that was driving so slow, I set my cruise so that I'd be behind him so I'd just follow along. He was very consistent with his speed, so he must have his cruise on also. But we were going 61. We were still breaking the law. If you try on your own to live a life, even once you're justified by your own means, you're going to fail because you are a sinful person saved by grace and we still wage war with that sinful nature inside of us. There will come a time in heaven when we are completely sanctified. Another thing we could talk about forever, that's complete sanctification and everything. Sanctification, being holy. Because you are sanctified when you come to con conversion, come to, when you're justified. But sanctification is also a process till the time that we spend eternity in heaven and we are completely sanctified. There is no chance that I will sin then because the Holy Spirit has totally taken control of me is the easiest way to put it. But until that point, I'm fighting a battle for here I was to here's where I want to be like Jesus in this world. And Jesus said to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And if you say that you can't be that way, then you're denying the power of the Holy Spirit that's inside of you again. But Paul was one of the greatest... Christians, if that's what you want to label of all times, and he said, I continue to constantly do what I choose not to do. Romans chapter 7 is not Paul before, and Romans chapter 8 is not Paul afterwards. Romans 7 is today, Romans 8 is tomorrow, maybe even today. I am living by my own power and my own might, and I'm failing, and I'm living by the Spirit, and I'm growing to be more like Jesus, and it's this constant battle all the time. I've got to die to myself so that I can let Christ live through me. And we find ourselves in a foreign relationship instead of a relationship like we should be because we don't embrace the power of the Holy Spirit. First thing, the Holy Spirit, use a pronoun, He, God Himself. And it's so easy just to get in conversation and talk about the Spirit as this thing. The Holy Spirit is He, God Himself, dwelling with you. You are spirit and flesh, and your spirit is to indwell and have a relationship and fellowship with the Holy Spirit so that you have a relationship with Jesus and with God, the Trinity. And then if we're obedient with our spirit, then our flesh will follow behind. We want to grow to maturity. Paul writes plenty of times about he wishes that the, that the people that he's writing a letter to were more mature, but he's got to continue to give them milk. <clears throat> you know what I think? I think the problem is the law, not the... I'm going through the chapters, if you don't know, not breaking them down. I think the problem is the law. If the speed limit was 65, I wouldn't have sped. There you go. The problem is not with the law. The problem is with the sinful man that I am. And that's all too slow. Now, if it was 100 or something, I probably wouldn't break the speed limit. 
But you know, there might be one day where I like. <laughs> the problem is not with the law. The problem is with me. What a sinful person I am. And I have to realize that I have to let the Spirit live through me if I'm ever going to be like Christ in this world, which is what I'm called to be. <clears throat> we are all guilty. We will all get caught. God's not this cosmic policeman, but we will be accountable for everything we do, even every thought. And we are all guilty. But guess what? Jesus paid the price for our guilt. There's the justification. And not only is there justification, but there's adoption to sonship. Where through the Spirit again, we can cry, Abba, Father. We left off in Romans chapter 5, verse 11, and I will start there so we can continue. Verse 9, since we have now been justified, that's past, we, we have been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him, and reconciled is put back in that right relationship, we're justified means we're set right in God's eyes. Reconciled means we have this new relationship with God. To him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled, there it is in past tense again, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have now received reconciliation. Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. And Paul talked about resurrection power over and over and over again. Are you living by this resurrecting power? Because if you don't realize it again, you're like Lazarus coming out of the tomb, you see why I use the scripture more, and keeping his grave clothes on him. That just doesn't make sense. Why would you keep the old sins? Why would you keep the old power that you live by, your own self, your own mind, your own spirit? Why wouldn't you get a new power, a new spirit, which you have in you, if in fact you've been justified? God living in you. Verse 12 then. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Man sins. Adam's not the reason that you sin. You sin because you have a sinful nature. Don't blame it on Adam. Don't blame it on Eve. Don't blame it on anyone else. The devil didn't make you do it. You chose to sin because that's what you wanted to do. And your sin against God, the penalty is eternal death. No matter how much I try and try and try to live a holy life on my own, I will fail, I will fail, I will fail. And you'll keep going through this cycle unless you get down Romans chapter 8. And it's not something you can learn and put into practice. There's any particular formula. It's spending time with Him because it's a relationship. You can have a good marriage, you can have a great marriage, you can have an indifferent marriage, you can have a failed marriage. It's all about how much you spend and how much you love the other person. And you belong to God because you're bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ and He gives you Himself to live in you, to have fellowship with you. But wait, can I use that old excuse that if the law was different... No, we already went down that road, didn't we? no matter what the law was, and then God wouldn't be holy if the law wasn't that way. But I would continue to sin even if the speed limit was higher because I am a sinful man. This is a position we're in in Romans chapter 5. But praise be to God, there is another man. That's why Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And he lived a sinless life, and through this one man comes redemption, become, comes adoption, comes a power to live as the children of God. Verse 15 of Romans chapter 5, But the gift is not like the trespass or the sin. For if many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by, by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through the one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man Jesus Christ? Now if you didn't notice it, I highlighted death reigned 
That means it had rule over your life. It had dominion and power over your life. And then the gift of righteousness reigned in your life, in the life you still live. And the only way, I hope I've set that up, that argument so far, because I'm going to continue to sin, is give the power and control over to someone else. Jesus, take the will if you'll take that song, but there's a lot more to it than that. Let the Holy Spirit have control and dominion and power in your life where you'll be like Christ. And the more you do that, the more you spend time reading, the more time you spend time thinking, the more time you do doing good things, fellowship with one another, the more that the sin of this world will seem foreign to you and the things of God will become commonplace for you. <clears throat> Here lies the quandary, though. If I'm saved... I'm expected to live a holy, set-apart life, and I cannot do it. So we've got to keep reading through in Romans chapter 6 and chapter 7 to find an answer in chapter 8. That's what Paul is doing here. The more and more I sin, the more and more grace is given. That's where we're at in Romans chapter 6. But we've died to sin... And we're supposed to live for Jesus. So it's absurd to think that I can keep on sinning more and more so that God's grace is more and more. Paul gives that argument and answers that argument. Romans 6 verse 4, We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life, not in heaven, here and now. Of course we will in heaven. We're here to live a new life now just as Jesus lived who didn't have a place to lay His head who thought of others more than himself, who went silently before his accusers and laid down his life to save someone else. That's a tough, tough thing to say that you're going to take part in. That's why Jesus said you've got to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow after me. Don't miss the next verse though, verse 5. For if we have been united with him in death like his... We will certainly also be united him, with Him in resurrection like His. Now. Understanding that resurrection power now while you are still in this physical body. Yes, we will groan. I'm getting ahead of myself to further chapter. We'll groan because we long for the day that Jesus returns. We'll groan because of the sin in this world. We'll groan because of the people that don't know salvation. All of creation is groaning, waiting for the day that Jesus Christ makes those things right. So are you living a resurrected life like Jesus today? Lazarus died and was resurrected, right? Do you think he lived life the same after that point? Do you think he took his grave clothes, on? We'll, took his grave clothes off? We'll look at that in a second. I mean, there's no way that he lived the same life that he lived before. You have been born anew by the Spirit of God. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven, let alone enter it. That's John chapter 3. So back to John 11, 40 through 44. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Is that just in the future or is that now? Verse 41, so they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe. That's what John's gospel, the whole point of it is, that you will believe, that you will come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, it's that you may believe that you sent me. Verse 43, when he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Polly said in Sunday school a couple weeks ago or whenever it was, she said, oh, Merle, he's always got these crazy questions. And she said, you won't believe his question that he said this time. He's, like, he's talking about Jonah. And he said, I wonder what Jonah looked like when he went to the, to the town of Nineveh. That's not a crazy thing to think of. You ought to think about things like that. Here, Jonah got swallowed by a whale. And I don't know that people saw him, but if people saw this guy being belched out, thrown up, however you want to say it, out of the mouth of a whale, or what? not a whale, fish, let me correct myself. Someone should have already corrected me. Whatever kind of fish it was, we don't know. And he's vomited up on the, on the uh, shoreline, and then he starts walking to Nineveh. And he doesn't give a big sermon. He basically repent or die, if you want to boil it down. But what did he look like? 
oh, one of the biggest TV shows out there is Walking Dead or any kind of zombie movies. We're intrigued with that. I guarantee you he looked kind of like that. He's been being digested for three days. So when he comes out, the people are like, whoa, first of all, this guy just got thrown up by a fish, and now he's walking around like this, and he looks like he looks, and he says, repent or die. I've got to listen to that guy, at least think about the things that he said, right? <laughs> what about Lazarus? What do he look like? Have you ever thought about it? What does Scripture say? We know that, it, that Scripture says he stinketh because <laughs> he'd been dead four days. Look what it says right here. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Okay, what happened? The dead man came out. Dead man. His hands and feet wrapped with, straw, with strips of linen and cloth around his face. Jesus said, take off the grave clothes and let him go. When you're studying and reading, read other translations, study commentaries, look at the original Greek words. The King James Version gives a much better version than the NIV does. And, he, and that was dead came, that what, which was dead came forth, which was dead now brought to life. I've got that implication here that there was death, now there's movement, there's life. There's life coming back, and it came back instantly enough that Lazarus was able to walk out on his own. It wasn't, again, this slowly coming back and spending time in the ER or anything. It was death, and then there was life. And then it says bound, not wrapped. Oh, that sounds a lot, lot stronger. Bound, hand and foot, with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith, saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. He was wrapped, he was bound by grave clothes. So the dead man got back to life and came out like this. Right? Because he's wrapped up. What if I continue my life like this? I'm alive, guys! I'm a Christian! What if you're still living by the power of sin in your life? And if you're living by my will, you probably still are. We need to live by God's will. And the only way we can do that is to live by His power, which means we live by Him who lives in us, living through us. So Jesus said, <coughs> loose Him. Sounds a lot different than take off, doesn't it? Loose Him from what had bound Him before that had... Put, put, put him in the realm of death so that he can be alive and then let him go so he can tell the world. If you read on in John chapter 12, Lazarus is there when, when Jesus is anointed. He's sitting at the table and all the people are sitting talking to Lazarus as much as they're talking to Jesus, listening to his testimony. Because he who was dead is now alive and they want to hear his story. And it was so much, if you read John chapter 12 that the Pharisees and Sadducees says, we got to kill Jesus, but we got to kill Lazarus also to stop his testimony. You were dead in your trespasses and sin when Jesus came to you and said, do you want to be freed? Why in the world would you want to still be wrapped in grave clothes? And so many Christians continue to try to live by their own power, don't understand that relationship with the Holy Spirit and try and try and try again and fail and fail and fail no matter what the speed limit's set at. <clears throat> if you believe you're justified and you've been set free from the bondage, the master that had dominion and power over you, the death that reigned so that you can reign a righteous life through the power of Jesus Christ. That's why he went to heaven and said, you won't be orphaned. I will send the advocate to you, the helper to you, to be with you forever. And know that wherever you go, there I'll be, and I'll never, ever forsake you or leave you. Continue on in Romans chapter 6, verse 6 says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. Is that clear? The, the sin that was in your life before is to be done away with. That we could, should no longer be slaves to sin. Why? 
Because God came to us when we were helpless and gave us the help that we need so that we're not helpless anymore as children of God. The Holy Spirit is the answer. Verse 13, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourselves to Him as an instrument of righteousness. Just as you used to offer yourselves, you offer yourself one way or the other, as slaves to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness, which leads to death, right? So now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, which leads to holiness. But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. Is that what you believe? Is it? Because if it is... You live that life of holiness now, and I can't do it on my own. So pardon my expression, Jesus, take the wheel. So well, take the gas pedal, too. Take my thoughts. Take my actions, everything else. And what's funny when you ever make that trip is, you know, you always laugh because all the people you pass and everything, you pull up to the light at Sandpoint, and they're all there beside of you anyway. It seems like it's just the way things work. What does the life of the believer look like? You're supposed to bear fruit. You're supposed to be like Christ. Is that what your life looks like? Romans chapter 7, verse 6. So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit. And not only in the old, old way of the written code. No matter how much I try to not break the law of speeding, I speed wherever I go. Is that what you want your life to say as far as your Christian walk? Wherever I go, I still continue to sin. I still take control. I don't let the Spirit lead me. I'm not becoming more and more like Jesus in this world. Maybe I should quit trying. Is that the answer? So let's read on. Romans 7, 14, and I did the New Living Translation. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me. For I am all too human a slave to sin. I want to drive faster. I want to break the law. That cookie up there that mom said don't get, I want it. But remember Romans 6, 6. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Verse 17 of Romans 7. As it is... It is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living within me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do, <clears throat> do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this is what I keep on doing. Verse 20, Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but is sin living in me. Those words Paul wrote about himself. Notice the change to I. I am a sinful person. I rage this battle all the time. But I don't want to give up. I, there is an answer out there. It is Jesus living in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. When I think about Paul writing these words, it just... It blows me away because I know what all he did for Jesus Christ, how much he suffered, how faithful he was, but how he struggled with sin each and every day of his life. No wonder I do. Keep on reading Romans chapter 7, verse 22, and I'm going to read into chapter 8. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, at work within me, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. 
Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but live according to the Spirit. I'll say again, did Lazarus live differently? What if he was never unbound? You pass those around on this side if I need more. Give me this instead. I'm going to swap. That one feels a little smaller. Fred, will you pass these around? These are for you. This is Romans chapter 8 where I've highlighted, just so you can see. And I'm not going to go into Romans chapter 8 that much. I want you to. I want you to study it. I want you to read it. I want you to look at how many times as you read up through chapter 8 that Jesus is mentioned, that God's grace is mentioned, that the answer is Jesus. But if you're going to live a life for Him, if you're not just going to die and go to heaven now, then the answer is in the Holy Spirit living in you and through you. You'll notice how many times that I is in there or we are in there. And you'll notice how many times Spirit is in there. <clears throat> what if we continue to live a dead man walking life? Jesus told them to unbound Lazarus, to take off his grave clothes, to, pay, to set him free, not to walk around like a dead man. Your job is to live and tell the story of Jesus Christ, the one who gave his life for you. Are you doing that? And you can't do it on your own because you'll continue to speed. The only way to do that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul constantly struggled with sin. He knew the answer, but he continually waged this spiritual battle that waged for his soul and control of his life. The answer is in this life of the Spirit. So if you've got a copy of it now, First of all, notice, therefore, that means it ties back together the previous arguments, and you could kind of go back to Romans chapter 5, because we talked about the law and the penalty of death for that. And then in Romans chapter 5, we talked about how Jesus has set us free. And since Jesus has set us free, he's saying here in Romans chapter 8, now, considering all that, there is no condemnation. You've been justified. No one will ever say to you, no one can say to, to you, God himself won't say to you, you are guilty of your trespasses and sin because you've been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember that. So now that you know that, if that is the case, then you've got the obligation and responsibility to live and you can't do it on your own. You couldn't save yourself. How in the world do you think you're going to live a holy life? Praise be to God that He does it through us. I said last week so many times, thank you, Jesus. I'm going to say this today. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Get into a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. Where I'm so in tune with the Holy Spirit that when I'm driving to Sandpoint, that I know that I should not break law, man's law, God's law, and I know it's trivial on speeding, but it's not. It's still breaking the law. That it is so foreign to me, I just automatically get in and set the cruise on 59. If you look at the green highlights... Those refer to Jesus Christ. If you look at the pink highlights, those refer to the Spirit. Look at all the Spirit in there. And like I said, if you look back in the previous seven chapters, I think there's two references. The yellow are us. The light gray are those. The problem is, is a lot, there's a lot of goats in the sheep pen. They think they're sheep, but one day they'll be separated. There are plenty that profess Jesus Christ. You've got the Sermon on the Mount where it says that, and they did mighty miracles in His name, but Jesus says, Depart from me, I don't know you. There are plenty that acquaint, that say they have a relationship with Jesus, identify with Jesus, but are not His. If you are His, the Spirit lives in you, and the fruit of the Spirit will reign in and through you. So you've got to examine yourself today and make sure that you have been justified. 
the best way to know that you're justified is that God is living in and through you. If not, you might want to examine it. The blue are God, references to God. If you notice down at the bottom, you get a little bit darker gray. I put a little darker gray down there because that encompasses Satan even in with it too. Because see, those are controlled by their master, Satan, rather than controlled by God. We don't kind of think about that, but we all sin because, Paul has presented the argument quite well, that we all serve another master. So once I'm born again, once I'm justified and set free, why would I still let that death grave clothes wrap me up and have power over me? And if I myself have my sin, the sinful nature dwelling in me, I can't do anything about that, but Jesus can through the Holy Spirit to where I'm 100% completely sanctified through and through. I won't sin again, which probably will not come until glory. Not going to go over Romans chapter 8. You are. If I did, we'd, uh, we'd be here a long time. I'm going to look at the clock now. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up by going briefly over Romans chapter 9 and 10. Because there's so many big topics in here that we'll miss the letter. Remember, this is a letter written to this church. They can go back and study it later and everything. But it's a letter that was presented to the church to read and to get them to encompass what Paul is saying throughout the entirety of the letter, which is what I'm trying to do here so that you'll go back and study it later. Romans chapter 9 talks about election and things. Woo, we could really go down some theological debates, couldn't we? And we don't understand that, and we, we don't know who's going to be saved and not saved. It's not for you to know the times or the season, but you will receive power so that you will be a witness for Jesus. And the more you witness, the more you live a life, the more that you are a witness to the person that you don't know whether they're going to be saved or not. And some of those are our children and our grandchildren and our parents. And those are the ones that look at us the most for our hypocrisy. How much more we need to rely on the Holy Spirit so that they can see Jesus through us because the world's going to tell them there's a ton of other ways. So you get down to verse 14 of Romans 9, and it says, What then shall we say? Is God unjust? No, not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. End of statement. God is God. He is just. He is loving. He's kind. You cannot comprehend His ways. You don't, you don't believe me? Go read Job today. See if you can wrap that around your mentality. We all sin. We all deserve God's wrath. But His grace is still flowing in this world today. Whether there's smoke and fire or there's not. So that we can praise God for the goodness that He gives us. The holiness that He is. The wonderful gift of salvation through faith through Jesus Christ. Which none of us deserve. So that we can tell others so that we can live a life empowered by the Holy Spirit. Verse 20 of Romans 9, But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who, is, who formed it, Why did you make me this way? Whoever you are, whatever your lot is in this life, God knows. Not a hair on your head will be harmed unless it's in His will. You are his before you ever were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And if you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, how much more you're His and how much more you're obligated to live a holy life. And I can't do it on my own. I've got to have the Holy Spirit. Verse 22. What if God, although choosing to show His wrath and make His power known, bore with great patience the object of His wrath, prepared for destruction? Think about Judas. Think about Pharaoh. It's not for you to think the theological debate, could they be saved and everything? We can talk about those whenever you want to. That's fine. But the thing is, is God was showing His glory even through those who would not bow down and worship Him. But there comes a day when every knee will bow and every name will declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Will you do it now while you have the chance? What if He did this to make the riches of His glory known to the objects of His mercy? Hopefully that's you. I don't know why he called me. I'm just thankful that he did. 
And I'm going to try my best to be obedient. And the more I try, the more I fail. So the more I've got to deny myself and, and let the Holy Spirit live through me. And I've got to know that that might mean that I don't want to do everything that I want to do. And it may even require suffering and taking up an instrument, instrument of death, which is a cross of humiliation and shame and persecution and death so that I can bring Him glory and live a resurrected life while I'm still here by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 24 says, Even us. We are the ones that are the objects of His mercy who have been prepared in advance for glory. Verse 30, What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But the people of Israel who pursued the law as the, way, as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal? Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Not many who are Israel, or called Israel, or of Israel, of the faith of Abraham. Only a remnant, Scripture says. Not everyone that professes Jesus Christ, that goes to church, is saved. Jesus says, many on that day will cry out. I pray that it is not one of us in here. That we all know the saving grace of Jesus Christ and live a life of worth empowered by the Spirit. Verse 33, as it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes, the one who doesn't stumble over Jesus, <clears throat> in him will never be put to shame. Romans chapter 10, we have a mission to live like Jesus in this world. But we can't do it. We've got to live by the power of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit can. The Holy Spirit will. As long as you don't deny the Holy Spirit. We could get even get in that debate of um, uh, unpardonable sin. <laughs> well, the unpardonable sin is not listening to the Holy Spirit. Whether it comes at conviction, whether you can lose your salvation, I'm saying all things, don't take, I'm going down this theological road we can go around. I'm not trying to make a point here of which one is correct or not. If you have been sealed by the Spirit, you walk by the Spirit. If you're not walking by the Spirit, there is a chance, whatever the percentages are, that you're not sealed by the Spirit. And that's what Paul's letter is trying to tell you. If you want to know without a doubt that you're saved, then you ask Jesus into your heart. You know that you're a sinner who cannot be saved on his own. You understand the grace that God has given you, and you say, please, Lord, forgive me of my sin and give me that. And then you listen to the Holy Spirit, which seals you for that day. And it's a struggle. It's a spiritual battle that we face every day and we need each other along the way to pick us up along that race that Hebrews said. So we, so we together throw off everything, that we run that race together and reach our goal. <clears throat> Romans 10 verse 4, Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes, that righteous standing and that righteous living. Verse 5, Moses writes... This about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. I can't stress it anymore. You cannot say you're saved and live the same old life and say, Well, I just struggle with my sins. Yeah, you do. They're right. So read God's Word. Study God's Word. Walk in step with the Spirit. Because the Spirit is the one who has control in your life. Verse 6, But the righteousness that is by faith says... Do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven. You can't bring yourself up. So Jesus came down to you, paid the price once and for all. Verse 16, But not all Israelites accepted this good news, for Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. But I ask you, did they not hear? Of course they did, even though there was only a remnant who were faithful. Their voice has gone out into all the, all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Again I asked, did Israel not understand? Verse 19. First Moses says, I will make you, you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you, make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I, have, I was found by those who did not seek me. 
I revealed myself to those who did not ask. So the question we get to at this point, where we're going to leave off here at chapter 10, and that says, will you read 11 through 15 next week? Will you commit to it? Will you go back and study? Will you study Romans chapter 8 and look at that? And not just a time or two. Look at what all God has done for you and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. The thing is, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and is He Lord? And if so, you've got to understand your relationship with God through His Spirit, through Him. Verse 21, but concerning Israel, He says, and one day He might say this to the church, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. There are many who hear who do not obey. There are many who see that don't understand. But if you are a child of God, then you have truly seen the light. You do understand. And it is Jesus living through you that makes the difference from now all the way to eternity. Are we hearing? Are we seeing? Are we living by the Spirit? Trinity, you going to come help me? John and Wanda, I mean, John and Denise, we're going to take communion again, and I asked these to come help me, and I'll show what we'll do in a second. Just stand right here. Because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, and I wanted to share communion with John again before he left, and I wanted to bring Trinity in here. Because she is a young example of a vibrant faith. We haven't talked enough to, to talk about her faith and everything, but I, I see the joy and the hope there, and I hope to be able to talk and, and mentor her even more with us. But I'm going to talk about communion for just a second, and then we'll take it. This is the what we do just like baptism, like circumcision was. It is something we do to show our knowledge of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done so that our children see what we say we profess so that when we live out in the world, they know that what we profess is true. That Jesus, by the representation of the, of the, by the bread representing his body, gave his body for us so that we in the body could live for him. And by his blood, the remissions of sin, you've been justified. He poured it out on the mercy seat of God so that you could enter the holy of holies by his spirit. The, 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 the temple curtain was torn and we have access to the Father through the Holy Spirit. Read Romans 8 over and over and over again. So we do this in remembrance of Jesus, what He did for us. It's a symbol. It's something we do together, and we probably don't do it enough. But I wanted to bring them in and help serve. So we're going to have bread and juice and bread and juice. You stand right here. Right here. You're good. And you can come up whenever. But remember, Paul says don't take it in an unworthy manner. 